few words about how this is going to go today. Uh, I think I want to start kind of with the end in mind. I do want to tell you what we're going to build first, so you have the idea. After this, I'll take a step back and show you like why uh, why we do need to think in a different way when we do data science. After this, I'll show you this rapid iteration framework, right? Because I think as a data scientist, you you should really quickly try to get value, and this is just uh, it's not just drinking a lot of coffee and uh, and writing code very quickly. It's actually about uh, it's it's a bit more involved than this. After this, I do want to show you some uh, basic Python uh, and basic uh, uh, NLP stuff because we do we will need this uh, for our data science product, which will build after that. And finally, I have some kind of uh, like a small small gift as well, which is a few take home exercises and projects. Um, because while doing this, uh, while preparing for this, I had other other cool ideas that you might just want to build yourself. I think a cool data science product. Maybe some of you want to actually do something similar. So I'll give you like some some ideas that they have. What we we'll build today um, is an analyzer for hotel reviews, and I do know that a lot of um, I mean everybody wants to build a portfolio in data science. I think it's one of the most important things when you want to uh, land a job. And everybody says that you should be doing uh, real world data sets, right? Uh, I would go even a step further and I think you should really do even uh, real world products, right? Because those, any model that you make, if it's not consumed by something, it really doesn't really deliver the value on its own. In our case, imagine you are, uh, our users are uh, hotel owners and they do want to have some, some kind of a tool which allows them to understand what people are saying about them right imagine you have some text box and they they can add an example review there click a button and they can understand more into detail in a more automated way what do the the visitors of the hotel say there so this is you can imagine a real use case and if you start to think about this problem i can guarantee you're going to find so many other cool data science things to do here i hope you can get convinced this you should really think about data products even today, the office I had this discussion actually with, with colleagues of mine is uh, because I was talking about data products, and somebody asked me, well, "But what is a data product?" And I would say this is it's a good question. And so, a data products, in my opinion, this is a software product which uses data and data science to provide some kind of a service to a user. So, here you might say, "Is a Jupyter notebook uh, a data product?" Uh, I would argue no, unless this Jupyter notebook is really consumed by some kind of a business user. If it's a report that somebody is going to read, uh, then I would say, yeah, for sure, that's a data product. But more, more likely a data product is something that has a front end, back end, and interface. What makes uh, data products quite hard is that you do need to integrate a lot of different things. And this is why Python, what we're going to talk today, uh, I know in the previous presentation, SQL was like held as a great language. It is a great language, but I would argue also Python. You can compare the two its apples and oranges, but you should really know Python as well, because Python is absolutely brilliant when you need to do a very creative data science, when you need to combine many different things. So, and this is what I want to show you. Um, making data products is very, very hard also because you do need to plan and plan ahead much more and the requirements are much, much trickier to, to make. And also those data products at the end, uh, since you're going to have a human user, right? Uh, think about our uh, hotel person. Uh, I can tell you anytime you build some kind of data science or a, a more like AI model, uh, I can tell you the first thing that, that users want to do is break it. You can see it with ChatGPT, even like one of the most famous data products right now, is that the people really love showing how ChatGPT makes stupid mistakes. I can tell you as a data scientist, anytime you build some model that has end users, they will try to break it and they'll complain a lot. Also, as I mentioned, uh, it requires a different mindset. You do need to think in a, in a bit of a different when, a way when you're uh, building such products. And you do need to collaborate like with other people quite a lot. So you'll be working with front-end people, with back-end people, um, and all of that. Uh, and testing, right? You can't afford your product to, to break, right? So uh, there's also edge cases for any machine learning model. There's so many edge cases that you often discover just in production. So all of those things make it very hard. But today, I want to show you that actually, with the right approach, you can be very successful very quickly.
you need to think real. I think uh, modern data scientists thinks in a bit of a holistic approach. You think not just about your data, but also you think about the users a lot, right? So you really have to think about who is going to use your work and also how does it impact the business? So I think uh, I would say as a, begin be a beginner data scientist, like you have so many things to do, but like I would say, arguably in your first six months after this, you should really start to focus a lot on the business and understanding how your work impacts the business. So you really need to think beyond your data, right? And with that, I would say you should also, uh, and fo being focused on value, right? A bit about the mindset, it's a vague word, uh, and I, I want to make it specific, right? In what you see today, uh, the code that I'll show you, it's, you have to be even open-minded to see that because you, you have to be comfortable with uh, interfacing with technologies you uh, think are not part of your job, right? So somebody would say, yeah, I'm a data scientist, I should just know Python. And uh, arguably, I would say, yeah, you can do 90% of data science there, but if you other the other 10%, if you know some JavaScript, if you know some HTML, CSS, I can tell you, you're going to be much more flexible. You'll be able to do so much more in data science. And this requires a bit of an open mind and not being closed in your field. This is the T-shaped distribution. Uh, you do need to uh, be okay with doing other other things which don't fit really in the traditional data science mode. And finally, uh, since it's so complex to do this work, you do need to kind of balance the forest and the tree so you can't at the same time uh, do everything, right? Uh, you can't be an expert uh, web developer and a data scientist and a product owner and uh, everything else. Uh, but still, you do need to kind of balance balance your skills there. And the approach, uh, and uh, we're just going to ju jump into the code in a little bit. It's one of the final slides before this, but this is the approach which I want to mention about data products. Uh, if you are going to build something like ChatGPT uh, from scratch, uh, it might look like the cathedral here on the left. I think this is the this is the famous Gaudi Cathedral in, uh, in Barcelona. And it took, I think, uh, 700 years to build, and they're still not ready with this. So uh, a very complicated data product uh, is extremely, it's, it's, it's full, full of stuff. It, it, it took many people, many, many months and maybe years to build, right? And if you uh, start building this as a cathedral, I mean, trying to do everything at the same time, you're not going to go very far. You do want very quickly to iterate. And the diagram that you, uh, that you see here is what, what I call closing the loop. Uh, this is very similar to the rapid prototyping uh, framework. So instead of building everything at the same time, you focus on the essentials. Like uh, imagine the start, middle, and end. This is the flow of uh, features, the flow of data in your product. Instead of building uh, just the beginning, let's say you just build uh, the visual interface and then you move on to everything. You try to get as fast as possible to the end and close the loop. Uh, just to make it very, very clear, for example, let's say your task is to build um, a machine learning product uh, that powers some kind of recommendation engine, right? I would the, the first thing that I would always do is really try to make the stupidest model and first and deploy that, right? So what I used to do is I would take the, the easiest features and all, most, most often those are features that didn't need any pre-processing, build a stupid model. I, I really almost didn't care about the accuracy and deploy this, right? And serve it as some kind of an endpoint. And only then uh, did I go back and start to improve that. And this is what I mean by the by closing the loop. Really do the whole flow of your product from the beginning to the end. Uh, in the, don't worry about your model not being great. Just finish it and only then go back. Because while doing this, you go and discover quite, quite a few things that you can improve. So this is the closing the loop approach. And here the second diagram shows you how actually you can take then uh, the, this minimal viable product uh, and iterate on this for the second version. Then you can add complexity, right? Then you can add more features. You can write more Python code. You can pre-process your data in a cooler way for the next version. So this is, I would say, one of the best ways to do machine learning and data science. All right, and fine. This is the, the final slide before we jump into the into the demo. I would say uh, uh, <laughs> there's a, a few strong opinions about when about uh, if you want to do uh, data products, notebooks are terrible. So I buy notebooks, I mean Jupyter notebooks. And it's a bit ironic because today I'll be showing you a Jupyter notebook actually. 
but for the purpose of teaching, they're great. But if you really need to develop data products and package your data science code, uh, this is more often than not, not gonna work. You should learn to work in uh, normal scripts. And I would argue that VS Code, if you're a beginner data scientist now, VS Code will allow you to do all kinds of things. Uh, not just the, the the normal data science stuff, but if you really need to deploy your work, like there's some nice uh, uh, nice plugins from from Amazon, for example, which allow you to do this, right? So I would really really recommend VS Code. You, you, many of you, I think, are starting data scientists as well. Really embrace the open source stuff. Uh, there there just there's just so, so many so many things, and I'll show you one of my favorite packages today. A good folder structure, I think, should go without saying because complexity is big uh, when doing such work. And more, most importantly, always use the virtual environment. Always, always, I will say, this is what I, I learned the hard way. Uh, for any small Python thing I did, I always use a separate small virtual environment. This would probably be the most used command on my terminal is uh, making a virtual environment. Uh, and using a linter, uh, for all for those of you who are not familiar, this is basically a tool which allows you to catch bugs in your code before you run it. I personally don't use too too much uh, that too much, but I, I have heard a lot of people evangelize. So I think if you really are doing a production uh, grade data science, I think you should check this out and uh, be comfortable with the command line. That's kind of the the last the last thing which I'm going to say here. Here, I just want to mention the kind of the NLP knowledge that I think we need today, but don't worry too much about those uh, four terms. And most of you probably have heard about sentiment analysis, but those terms I'll explain in a second, right? When I show you the, the Python code. And of course, here below, I have a disclaimer that there are so many cool topics that you can have a look. Uh, of course, everybody talks about large language models, transformers and all of this, but we're just going to do the basic NLP stuff today. Well, with this, now let's let's go to, to the practical demo. And I have a very blank notebook here. And I will attempt to, to show you like one of the best like uh, data science packages for NLP. And this is called NLTK. NLTK, right? Which stands for Python for a Natural Language Toolkit. And NLTK is one of those uh, packages which is really like, uh, uh, it's not the most, uh, it hasn't aged very well. So I haven't seen people using it in production, but if you're really learning uh, natural language processing in Python, that's that's really one of the, uh, like the, the workhorse of that. I'll show you the modern like alternative to this, but for basic data science, I just want to show you this. And there's actually a very cool book, which uh, comes with a package uh, and really you can learn all kinds of uh, uh, NLP stuff there. All of those Python packages which do deal with uh, NLP, they normally have data sets associated with them, right? Those data sets can be anything, but for today we we'll need actually uh, one of them. And by the way, I'm not using a normal um, a Jupyter notebook. I'm actually using a Jupyter Lab. So if you do use uh, <laughs> notebooks, use Jupyter Lab, not just your base, basic Jupyter notebook. This allows me, for example, to create several. Um, I can have several notebooks together. So uh, it's it's a cool tool. I would say you can change the theme. So this for for demonstration purposes is pretty cool. Um, what you see here that actually I had this data set already because I prepared for this uh, and we will use this data set in a second. But the, for the first thing, we do want to get some text and I'll just copy and paste this here for all of those of you who like football and all the World Cup finished some time ago, but uh, for all those Lionel Messi fans, this is actually a small text about him, which I picked and we will be analyzing this text. Uh, nothing, nothing too special about this uh, this text. Just several sentences uh, about football. Uh, but one of the first things that you want to do in data science is uh, actually uh, split split this text into different sentences. And for this, we have a very useful function in NLTK. And this, the process of, of splitting something into smaller parts is called tokenization in natural language processing. So we will, uh, we will import two things. Two things. We're tokenized and then tokenized. I forgot to actually import. Exactly right. So those two functions. So let's say we do want to split this text in several sentences. Uh, tokenize and pass the text. And let's see, let's see what comes out of this one. So I guess like nothing, nothing too fancy. Uh, you might think 
so what, what you get in the end is just a list of those sentences. Like it's very standard uh, uh, Python data structure, and obviously you can you can store this and you can do things with this. Uh, but let's say we do want to split it into into different words. This these steps what I explained to you here they're very often used when you do want to pre-process your data and you want to prepare for more advanced tasks. And if you want to split the text into uh, a words, let's take the first sentence. We're tokenized, and then we take uh, just do this, and this should take us the first the first element of this and uh, give us just the words of that sentence. If you have a look into this, like it, it's uh, you see other things, and here where here the NLP work starts to pick up because you see like comma that's not really a word, right? That's punctuation. If you have a dot. And not everything is interesting to us. When, when you're doing data science on text, you don't care about words like the, a, uh, s. These words don't, don't have such, such, a, such an important meaning to the data set. These are called stop words, and uh, we do want to remove them, right? So for stop words, uh, this is data set, I already mentioned this. And let me show you the, the stop words. How do they look like? This is how you extract them. I think I also have to, to import. Stoppers from the corpus, correct. I'm just going to copy and paste this code. Exactly. And let's have a look at those English stop words, what, what they are, right? And you have this big list of things like, I don't know, maybe uh, 70 of them. Yeah. Uh, you have them for other languages, of course, but in our case, this is going to do a trick. And here we're going to do something that beginning beginner data scientists in Python get very confused with. And this is a very Pythonic way to do things. If you come from other languages, it might be a bit uh, weird for you. Our task, remember, is to take the, the words of the sentence and really uh, remove the stop words from them. And the, the way you do this um, is with something called this comprehension. But first, let's, uh, let's add a place where we can store our words. And here, do the list comprehension. Basically, this is a way in one liner to do a for loop with a condition. We can iterate through uh, items in a list, do some stuff to them and store them in a new list based on a condition. So let me write this up. So basically, we iterate through the uh, words list here that we created already. So we iterate through a words list and uh, we store the word only if the lowercase of that word, because you see those top words actually were all lowercase here. Yeah. So otherwise you can't compare properly. Oh, so you see, I have uh, an error here, word lower words, if here, I forgot the if. Right. And let's see, let's see how this looks like. Get the words, yeah, you see. Uh, it remove that, right? So this, I would really urge you to to learn learn this part of uh, of Python. Yeah, it it looks weird, I know, but actually it's a very elegant way to do things. So basically, this is uh, like very very basic stuff here, basic NLP. I think as a homework here, I could suggest like if somebody wants to try this, take uh, to try to remove the punctuation. Uh, I think it's pretty uh, like it's a good exercise. So now I want to show you uh, before we move uh, to the next stuff. To actually the product, I want to show you my favorite Python package for NLP. It's called Spacey. Uh, it's actually a company from Berlin. I'm a bit biased, but they, they have a very, very one of the best tools. I check out the website. Have they just like one of the best NLP tools out there? We need to load the machine learning model first. This is actually uh, they have done a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So uh, a lot of the a lot of the machine learning that you need in uh, in your NLP work, they have done, and you can download those models and just use them. And uh, let's say uh, we can take a piece of text. Uh, let's take a different one now, a bit like simpler, a very simple sentence that we have here. And if you do this, uh, if you uh, make this use this NLP function, which is actually a model and pass the text to this. This document becomes very interesting. You can actually look, you can iterate through this. And I'll show you, show you exactly how this tokenizes everything immediately, right? In this one line, you already tokenize your text. So what we did with NLTK, it's already done here. And you can actually do something called part of speech uh, tagging, right? So you can uh, have a look. These words that you have in the text, what are they? Is a pronoun, is a verb? It's an adjective, it's a noun, it's punctuation, right? You can see this, how powerful this is, right? You can use this also to remove things. If you don't, if you want to remove all the punctuation, you can just iterate like this, right? 
it can do much, much cooler things. Uh, I'll show you some of the best visualizations like you can see here. You can use something called Displacy, which is like uh, another part of uh, Spacey. Let's see if this works. Exactly. So you, here you can see this very cool HTML visualization, like which shows you how the different words here relate to each other. So I know you guys probably don't have the, the NLP experience, but this is actually becomes very advanced here. Like you do want to see how different uh, words in the language relate to each other. And this is very valuable for all kinds of reasons, but this already allows you to, to visualize. Actually, we're going to use something like this in the product. I do want to go back now to the to the presentation and jump back to what we're actually trying to build. This was like a bit of a short, uh, like very, very short crash course into NLP with Python. Trust me, you can do so much more than this. Uh, reach out to me. I can send you some cool resources. But remember what you want to build here. You want to use what we learned now to build a product. And first thing you want to do is actually draw a system design. You do want to see... Uh, the, all the different elements that you need to do. And here, we do want the user to interact with the product in some way. So obviously, the easiest thing to do is a uh, uh, web browser-based product, right? Instead of building an app, for example. Typical things I have selected here, everything is Python-based, actually. Here you see JavaScript, but that's actually HTML and CSS. Uh, this, uh, Bootstrap, it just basically allows you to have a nice uh, graphical interface. Uh, you don't need to code any, any CSS. But Flask is a Python micro framework for making APIs. And we're going to use this actually as, also as, uh, as uh, our backend. And for the machine learning uh, stuff, we're going to use Spacey, or the, the tool which I just showed you, and also a package called Vader uh, for sentiment analysis. As I mentioned, take advantage of all those tools. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like if you have something that you need to build, most normally there's some open source for this. And Flask actually, uh, big websites, I, I do think that Quora actually runs on Flask. I think some, some really big websites run on Flask. So it's very, very powerful. And now let me show you how a product looks like, right? So here I'll actually open VS Code. I'll practice what it preached. So let me already make this bigger. What is really cool about VS Code is that if you if you want to do a more, uh, like as I mentioned, if you do develop more products, you do want to work with different technologies, like you don't have an alternative, basically. You do want to get used to it. The code here at PY, it contains all the code that we need for the application, like 34 lines of code. That's the whole backend that we need. And I'll show you how it looks like. So the, the we start to see here already familiar things. Remember how we loaded the, the spacey model. So that basically the same thing that we do here, we load it here. How you web products work like in, in general APIs, right? You make endpoints. So the different endpoints, you can imagine these are different parts of your product which are responsible for different things. So here with uh, backslash, this is the your root, like the home of the product, which is like our hotel owner. This is the place where they go at the beginning when they visit the site and this is what they see. And here you can see uh, it passes uh, indexed HTML file. The HTML is the language of the web. So this is what you uh, what you do need to send to the hotel owner so they can have some interface. I'll show you how that looks like in a second. But the magic happens here in Analyze. And as a data scientist, normally your job is to take your code from Jupyter Notebooks. I mean, if you're a data scientist who writes for production environments, which I would argue many, many should try to do because it's where the value comes from. Your job normally is to prepare the code for some kind of an endpoint. I would I would agree that rarely you need to make your own HTML templates, but often you do need to package your code in a way that it can execute uh, on an endpoint and be deployed. And here you see this exactly the same stuff that we did in the short tutorial. We use like the NLP method to, to take the review text that the hotel owner uses. Uh, to, to analyze this basically, right? And we, here we use again the uh, fancy HTML visualization, which I showed, and we do want it then to output this. And here the last uh, new piece of code is actually here. Uh, what happens here is use the Vader, uh, the Vader package. It has a nice, a very nice actually, um, a method to detect the sentiment of, uh, of a piece of text. There's nothing that I just, you have to make an object and then you can use this object to get the, the sentiment of a text. And this review text, I'll show you in a second where it comes from. Just remember here the methods post. This another thing as a data scientist, I think we should have a look like the different REST methods, how they look like. Post is one of the most used ones. Basically, it means that the hotel owner will send some data for us to analyze. 
And this data, it's it's stored here in the in this form. I'll show you like in the template, then I think you understand this. And finally, you get data into this function here and you do want to return it to the product again. You do want the hotel owner not just to submit the request to analyze the text, but also you do want to uh, send them the result because that's the whole point of the product. You want them to see the sentiment uh, of, of the review, for example. Uh, the rest of the code is Flask code, right? I don't want to go too much into detail with this. You have to make inst instantiate your application and then you have to run it, right? And how you run it is you just run this, this file on the command line and then uh, you'll see the product. All right, so this is actually how it looks like. And I want to show you the index HTML template and you see on the right here, the real product, right? That, uh, that from those 30 lines of code, this is what you get at the end. And the front end, um, I mean, you do some see some HTML. If you're not used to reading HTML, you might find it a bit um, hard at the beginning. But trust me, once you've seen like how HTML works, it becomes very simple. Here's Bootstrap. Actually, this is the, the stuff which makes everything look relatively cool. But the magic happens in this form, right? So here we have this review text, uh, which is, uh, takes the data in this text here. So anything I write here, for example, what would the person write? Let's say your review is, um, I really enjoyed staying at the hotel at March. I uh, even managed to see David Beckham around the hotel, right? And this is actually a fun example because I want to show you something. Uh, but this text is what gets sent. If I click Analyze, uh, you see this is the API endpoint. This text is going to go to our backend code. And this is going to execute here, right? And return, you're going to get the sentiment and the visualization. So this is uh, this is all there is to it, right? And here, this is code. Actually, this is Python code being executed uh, in your um, in your HTML, right? So here, you can just take the sentiment and you can just visualize this and mix it with HTML elements. Now let's 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 see uh, how this works. And what I did here. I visualize I use one of those fancy to, spacey tools to show you like catch dates, for example. Uh, if, if somebody mentions some something which is like a date, we, our model actually detects this. Uh, if somebody mentions a celebrity or a person name, they will, they will be labeled as a person. Can you imagine why this is important? Like you can start to think about all the different use cases you can do. And of course, more importantly, the sentiment, right? So let, let's play around. Let's see how this changes. Um, but I really hate it. Uh, hated that the floors were dirty, right? So let's see if the sentiment is going to decrease. Yeah, you see now it became much, much more negative, yeah? Um, so this is actually the product, I would say. Uh, but this is actually how you can build the real data science product. And I didn't cover how you deploy this. I didn't cover how you can uh, authenticate here because obviously your users do need, you do have several users at the same time. They want to store their data, for example. I didn't cover any continuous integration or delivery. So basically the testing stuff, how do you make sure that uh, every time you change this, uh, you don't mess it up for the user. And of course, it didn't cover any payment stuff. So if you had an idea right now to make a startup out of this code, uh, yeah, it's, you still have some more work to do. Feel free to steal this idea, by the way, and build a startup, build a product, sell it, uh, whatever you like, but you need to do all of those things. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more things you need to do. And here is like some, some gifts from me. Uh, I would say if you do want to uh, exercise a bit what you learned, try to add those things which I, uh, which I didn't cover, right? Try to uh, add authentication here. Try to deploy this thing. Uh, maybe add some data processing, right? Because you can make it so much more. You can remove edge cases from this, right? You can imagine situations where the product is not going to work very well. So you can just try to improve it. Arguably, the second exercise which I have here is cooler. There's uh, uh, the concept of word embeddings. I didn't cover it today. It would just take two. It's, it's a very advanced concept in in, uh, in NLP, but super important for data science. You can use Pacey basically to compare the uh, meaning of two words, right? Based on their uh, context. So uh, you can use this. And I, I'm just going to give you some tips, not too many, but uh, there's such a room to make products, uh, data products, which focus on explaining technology or medical terms, right? These are both fields which are full of different terms, which many people don't understand. But you can build a tool which tries to explain them with machine learning, right? Similar to ChatGPT, but actually there's, I can tell you, there's a much easier way to do it. I have done this myself before. 
and you can use word embeddings for this. And I'm going to give you a second tip, which maybe is a too much of a tip. Maybe it's like, it's, uh, uh, it makes it too easy even, but there's a method called more similar, and you can use this to make such a product. Feel free to reuse any of the components, right? The bootstrap, the flask, and uh, just don't reinvent the wheel, right? Once you build one front end, trust me, you can build all kinds of front ends, right? You can actually use the open AI uh, API as well. We can just take the same flask app, which I showed you, and basically hook this up to the uh, open AI API, right? If you do want to use that, like it's actually a bit pricey. Uh, it's not so cheap to use. But still, uh, if you really want to use to make one of those new startups about you, that use the generative AI, you can do that. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is this code is ready for that. So I used all kinds of cool tools here uh, and just want to mention them, right? Uh, obviously, use ChatGPT for, for brainstorming. I actually use it quite often to just to think about ideas. I can tell you this is just the future. I know people complain about it, that it's not accurate or whatever, but... Uh, for a kind of brainstorming, it's amazing, right? If you feel feeling stuck, it just it just helps a lot with brainstorming. I'm a big fan of also GitHub Copilot. Um, I uh, I don't code on my day job. I, I haven't I don't code for work for quite a long time right now. So for me, when I want to remember some concept I learned in data science a long time ago, Copilot is just great. It just reminds me exactly how to do things. I use Dali uh, from also from OpenAI AI degenerative. Uh, um, a model to make diagrams. So this, for example, on the right is made by this, and you can actually see uh, how it messed up here because it said, make me a tip of the iceberg, and you see the tip is actually bigger than the bottom. So uh, I wanted to do something else here, but I use this to make the diagrams. This cool diagram, which I made here, uh, is also created with code. We saw two code diagrams as code. Quarto, uh, I use Quarto to make the, the plots. So here it's not PowerPoint, uh, it's uh, it's actually Markdown. And I have this nice interactive presentation. So yeah, just embrace those tools. From my side, like some closing remarks, uh, of course, uh, I'll be happy if you have a look at the books. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and Twitter. I just love uh, hearing from the new generation of data scientists because you guys just have like the future is really in front of you you have so many amazing tools and don't worry when somebody said uh, says chat gpt is going to automate uh, your job this is not going to happen anytime soon uh, and it just if you use those tools actually you're going to be much uh, stronger uh, and i just can't wait to see what uh, uh, your generation of data scientists makes there's so many challenges that we need to do and I can tell you the future of uh, data science is just going to explode uh, even more and more. I think it's the best time to become a data scientist it's right now. And yeah, you can always, of course, as I mentioned, follow my updates on uh, my website. Boyan, a big thank you. Thank you for spending thank a little you. extra time answering questions today.